Mike, why don't you start? Yeah, can we start? Um, what should you be doing? How many of you are first year students? First, first class have you ever taken in graduate school? Most of you? All right, graduate school is very different from undergraduate school. And the thing that I really enjoyed about graduate school, from a general standpoint, maybe with several of the, of the uh, classes that you'll be taught accepted, in undergraduate school, to a certain degree, you're taught what to think. When you get to graduate school, hopefully you learn how to think. And there's a big, big difference, I think, between the two. You've proven yourselves you have an undergraduate degree. And now what you need to do is think on a completely different and higher level. Some of the things that I look for in the, in the analysts that, that I hire are the ability to write clearly and succinctly. I work for Senator Hugh Leatherman. His calendar is filled in 15-minute increments. He makes million and billion dollar decisions. If I get an issue before him that's five minutes a time, that's a lot of time. A lot of times he will like to read things beforehand. Three paragraphs, maximum. Give me the details, but give it to me quickly. So your ability to do that is going to be extremely important. The second thing that I think you need to do as you move forward is to consider very strongly uh, developing your critical thinking skills. That doesn't mean being critical of everybody, but look at everything that you encounter in the governmental se sector with somewhat of a jaundiced eye. Really look at it critically and think about what are the holes that I can punch in this thing? Because if you're trying to defend that thing, the holes will be punched and you better be ready with an answer. A third thing that I would suggest to you is um, particularly sit back and in, uh, enjoy and absorb your theory classes. Administrative behavior, organizational theory. Now those are going to pr probably be the more drier ones that, that you look at and that you study. But you know what? They're the ones that I remember the most. And I graduated from uh, MPA school at the other Carolina uh, back in uh, 1983. So I would admonish you to uh, consider those three things and enjoy it. Graduate school is a lot of fun. And you know what? I'd kind of like to go back. <laughs> so with that, Ben, it's all yours. Oh, OK. Uh, what's that time then? Mike's an academician. You can tell that by the way he talks. I'm more of a practical. Uh, Practitioner, rather. Exactly. <laughs> uh, my career started with in state government as very low level in 1984 uh, as a computer operator. Uh, I wasn't sure what I wanted to grow up and be. I still don't know, uh, but uh, that's where it started and and progressed through my hard work and experience through uh, state government. And one day I got a call to see if I wanted to be, you know, I worked my way through human resources levels. And one day I got a call to see if I wanted to be human resource director in the governor's office. And at that time it was Governor Campbell, Carol Campbell. And Mike and I had gone through a training class within the Budget and Control Board. And we were preparing ourselves. Uh, at that time I, um, I did not have my MPA. Uh, but when I got that call, I was ready uh, and accepted that position. But I had a little dilemma. I grew up as a Democrat in Sumter, South Carolina. Most African Americans are Democrats. And they asked me to go work for a Republican governor. That was extremely different. And I wasn't sure what I wanted to do and if I wanted to do it. But uh, after talking to a few people and getting some advice, they said if the governor asked you to come be his human resource director, you don't have a choice. <laughs> and so uh, I accepted the position. Uh, it, it was a very enlightening posi uh, position. And uh, it was in Governor Campbell's last two years of his, in office. Learned a lot. you think that the governor's office would have a different set of problems as far as human resources, and they didn't. 
Uh, at the time, there were about uh, 200 and some employees over there. And part of the governor's office is like any other state agency. They, they have offices <coughs> over there that they, they do normal uh, state agency's operations. And there were many problems, and you had to deal with those things. Some were political because some of the people knew the governor. And sometimes you don't handle those situations the, no, the way you would normal, normally handle any other employee. So it was very enlightening and it was very, uh, and Mary worked with me for a while uh, there in the governor's office. And it was, uh, it, it was, it was interesting and arresting uh, the way you had to handle some of those situations. And uh, at, you know, working for Governor Campbell for two years, Governor Beasley won, I was promoted to Director of Administration, Finance, IT, and Human Resources. And that's where the enlightenment about graduate school came in. I was looking at all these new applications coming in. All the applications had at least an MPA or some other master's level uh, uh, degree. And I said, ooh, I need to go back to school. And during that time, Governor Beasley was having some problems uh, in his administration. And I said, ooh, I do need to go back to school. <laughs> uh, and sure enough, this is a short version. Sure enough, he lost in November. I graduated in December. Uh, so I had a little background uh, to, to help me in whatever my next career. Mark, I think uh, Mr. Fowler's out there. Uh, I had a little background to help me with whatever my next career was going to be. Sure enough, God, Governor Hodges won the election, and I was the first one to be called in and terminated because it was an at-will position. But I was quick on my feet, and I outlined everything they needed to do, you know, being in charge of finance, IT, and, and uh, personnel. Uh, you know, there was a lot of things that I knew that they needed to do, budgets and uh, putting people in the right offices and a lot of logistics. And so the person that terminated me said, hey, let me get back with you. And uh, it was uh, Mike LaFever, I'm sure you all know the name. Mike came back and said, Ben, can you just hang around for a couple of months and we'll make sure that you are uh, placed in another agency somewhere. And that happened. And sure enough, I was at the, back at the Budget and Control Board and I was there for about a year. And then, uh, was reappointed at the Department of Parks, Recreation, and Tourism under the Hodges administration, which was a, a appointed position, which was the best job I've ever had. Parks, Recreation, and Tourism, just imagine. Uh, make sure the parks are taken care of. When you get a chance, you can go out to the parks and uh, get to look at some of the tourism sites. But uh, I did the same thing, as, uh, the same job as I, I was doing in the, in the governor's office, finance, IT, and personnel. Uh, and I, uh, stayed there until the end of uh, Hodges' administration, and then got a call from Governor Sanford's office, uh, from Dr. Fred Carter, asking me to become the governor's budget director. I wanted to say no, but if you all don't know Fred Carter, but you do. Mm -hmm. That is the last person, Mary, you know Fred Carter. That is the last person that you would tell no, and Fred was his chief of staff. And I asked Eddie Gunn, who's a deputy director with, uh, in, the, in the Budget Control Board, what if I tell Fred no? He didn't say a word. He didn't answer. He just looked at me. And I knew the answer, that you do not tell Fred Carter no. And so I worked for Governor Sanford for about 18 months as his budget director, about as much as I could take, working day and night. You had a full head of hair before that. Full head of hair. <laughs> and Mike, you know, because I called you crying a couple mm -hmm. of times. <laughs> uh, stayed there for, for 18 months. Then uh, went to South Carolina State for 12 months, jumping from the frying, frying pan to the fire, though. But uh, we all, we've done that before. Uh, stayed there for a year to the day and uh, ended up at the Department of Insurance as uh, Deputy Director for Administration. Again, finance, IT, and personnel. Can't run for those things. Uh, and thoroughly enjoyed my tenure with the uh, Department of Insurance, and that's the longest I've kept any job. I've been there about five years now. Uh, usually I'll stay two years and I'm gone somewhere else. Uh, but uh, great job. We do have our difficulties right now with the budget. And Mike might get into some of the budget issues a little later. Uh, one, we have one saving grace that we do charge 
uh, for we do we do collect fees for some services, and that saves us. Um, our budget is about eighty twenty. Um, 80 in fees and 20% uh, general fund dollars. So that has helped us a lot. Uh, we have some big issues to deal with because I used to, over the last three years, we've lost about 50% of our general funds. And that's very difficult for any state agency. So survival is part of it right now. And meeting our mandates. We talked about that a few minutes outside. Uh, you have specific mandates to meet. And on occasions, uh, the legislature decides that they want to bring in the Legislative Audit Council to see if you're meeting those mandates or, or your uh, regulatory responsibility. So if we cut, say, 30% of our staff, we can't meet those regulatory responsibilities. So what do you do when the legislature is bringing in the Legislative Audit Council to see if you're meeting those mandates or those uh, re regulatory responsibilities? So it's a kind of catch-22 situation. You try to do the best you can with what you have and maximize those benefits. And that's what we've done over the last three years. Uh, that's about it that I have for you. Just be prepared, like Mike said. Learn as much as you can uh, so that you can be prepared when you meet those uh, challenges that will, will confront you. Um, I've spent my whole um, professional life in the nonprofit world. so. I will echo a lot of what you've heard already, but maybe just from a, a slightly different perspective. Uh, I, my first strong advice to you is that you graduate in the top of your class. <laughs> because, um, as you've heard already, the government obviously is shrinking while expectations uh, are either there or continuing to increase. And it's the same thing in the nonprofit world. So I, I read something recently that suggested the nonprofit world is in the same kind of realignment that will result in a 25% uh, reduction in nonprofits uh, in, in the country. So that means that uh, the jobs that are out there are going to be very competitive and we're going to be looking for people who are uh, very, very multi-talented. So one of the things I would also suggest is that you uh, probably don't over-specialize because no matter what you do, you are going to be doing lots of different things. So. I would try to uh, really think big in terms of the way you pursue whatever uh, optional coursework you have uh, and, and, and try to get as much exposure as you can because you don't know, as you can see, these, these checkered careers here, that uh, you're, you're going to be doing lots of uh, potentially uh, uh, different things. And I, I, I certainly have too. I would really echo uh, very, very strongly that you need to work on your communication skills. And that is so distinguishing. Uh, when you are looking at applications and you see that people can't really write even in their letter to you, it's, it's just the easiest dismissal. So you've got to be absolutely uh, persuasive uh, in your uh, ability to write and your, uh, your ability to speak. Uh, you, and some of what you were talking about, the, being very concise and precise in, in, in the way that you present things. And that helps you, it, you know, obviously some of you will be doing policy work, but in my world, I transferred a lot of my graduate uh, school work, which was not in an MPA, but the analytical skills, the writing skills, I do a lot of resource development. So in terms of uh, making sure that I can uh, secure funding through grants and then also be accountable to folks in the way I report on my grants, you know, that, that persuasive piece is really going to be critical. Uh, the other piece that I would really uh, urge you to do is, yes, uh, the analytical skills and make sure that you understand how to use data. And I am not uh, very sophisticated in terms of uh, statistical analysis or anything like that. But you have got to understand some fundamentals about uh, what data says, doesn't say, and how you can use it to say what you need to say. So pay attention when Mark is teaching, because it's really, really going to be important, uh, the, the data skills. Um, in general, I would say that, that not only is the, the nonprofit world uh, shrinking, um, but what we're increasingly being called on to do is to work uh, collaboratively and uh, regionally. So however that translates into your learning experience, uh, keep that in mind. Uh, I know that you'll hear, hear, well, I mean, you'll hear from everyone here that you, you might be working for a particular municipality 
or for a particular nonprofit, but there is almost nothing that you're going to be able to accomplish by yourself because these problems are not uh, easily defined by geography or by uh, issue area. So uh, those kinds of skills that are the, the soft skills, understanding how to approach those kind of problems in that way and keeping that perspective, you know, I, I encourage you to, to think that way. And then finally, and this is very self-serving, uh, I would recommend that you get as much uh, experience, and I know lots of you are straight <coughs> through students, but I would recommend that you get as much uh, experience in the uh, uh, world that you'd like to enter while you're in school. And we can provide those opportunities. So uh, yes, we are doing a homeless count uh, in January. And anyone that is interested in helping with that, uh, I'm, please call me. But if you're not interested in that in particular, uh, and you have ideas, or you just want to talk to folks uh, about what you might possibly do, either as a volunteer or as part of your coursework, I encourage you to contact me and probably some of these other folks, too, uh, for those kinds of opportunities to do the applied work uh, uh, while you're in school because we really uh, benefit a lot. I've had some really talented MPA and social work students helping advance our work, so we welcome that kind of um, participation. So that's, that's my <coughs> sell to you today. Well, I'm uh, Milton Pope. I'm presently the uh, County Administrator of Richmond County, and, and all of the time, <coughs> you know, when we kind of speak at it, um, events like this, you hope that you can say something that just kind of inspires someone in the audience and you will remember this lifelong and then sometime 40 years from now when you're some big CEO or head of the city manager of Phoenix or something like that, you're going to kind of take it back to a discussion like this. Um, I don't know if you're going to get that today, but I just thought I'd just mention it. <laughs> um, but I guess one thing that I would say to you is and I'm certainly not going to try to repeat because everything that some, everyone said thus far is very beneficial. But I would advise you on in knowing yourself. I know when, uh, of course, I was in your shoes, of course, most of us, you may have an idea of what you want to do, but you clearly still don't know what you're going to be able, what job you're going to be able to land based upon your, your graduation. So, and that's fine. Um, but in the area of public service, and I think that's what it is, just depending on if you decide that you want to work on the local level, the not-for-profit, or on the state or the federal level, uh, by having an MPA uh, degree, uh, I would really encourage you, as Ben said, as being a practitioner also is, is to get involved and to be more knowledgeable of what is going on in your local government with the politics of the day. Um, you are, and it's free of, uh, free of uh, cost to you, but attending city council meetings, attending county council meetings, I mean planning commission meetings, I mean really truly kind of finding out why you have one of the most fabulous times in your life while you're a student is to truly kind of find out really what's going on because I think what happens is, or at least it was my experience, in, in the academic world, I mean you're kind of surrounded by great professors and instructors I'm teaching you political theory, but and some of those things, of course, will be very useful when you get in your careers. But the reality, sometimes, of the, the operating world is sometimes quite different, and so you can get a good feel for that by just going out and participating and finding out uh, truly what's going on. The other thing is, and I'm sure uh, Mark and your other professors have you do this, but really kind of uh, follow um, the information of the day. I, Never will forget, I know my political science, one of my political science advisors in college used to always advocate just reading the Christian Science Monitor. I'd never read the Christian Science Monitor before taking his class, but really having a depth of knowledge about um, the world that you live in. And now, of course, the world is so small, it is very smaller than uh, when I was in school. Um, another thing I'd like to just kind of offer to you is a plug for our, and I see uh, Bill here, but a uh, plug for our City County Managers Association. We have an association uh, made up of uh, city uh, managers, county administrators, and managers, an association that supports uh, public administration. And of course, when you, or if you were to attend some of our meetings, you will see that a lot of those folks are very tenured, and uh, we're looking for the new wave of folks who are going to be replacing a lot of us in um, um, governing uh, our um, localities uh, as we kind of phase out. So. 
we're going to have an opportunity here in Richland County in January of this year to host our winter meeting. We have two meetings a year. And it's going to be an opportunity where the students can uh, attend that. And you can begin that networking process, which I would strongly advise you to, um, um, to, um, to take, um, take stock in that. We'll be sending uh, Mark information about that where you can take advantage of that because networking is, is very uh, important when it comes uh, to um, um, the local government. Uh, situation here in South Carolina because most people you're only one or two people removed from knowing in and everyone um, so um, I would just encourage you really just to take full advantage of all of the educational and academic opportunities that you have here but also try to get some information from a realistic standpoint of what's going on, on with the daily grind I know of course and Mike knows this from the budgeting standpoint of course local governments are very impacted by what the state uh, does or does to us. <laughs> uh, so from the federal government, so, and you can, you, I mean, you have all of that information, especially by going to the great university that you go to, of having all this uh, just kind of at your fingertips. So I strongly advise you to take advantage of it. Now you get to throw tomatoes, now you can ask questions. Now I'm done, so now you can really ask all the burning questions. Mark's the time for questions. <laughs> Anyone? The young lady here, she has a question. I see it's, it's written. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. How did you kind of just get started after grad school? Like, what was your first step? Was it contacting old like people that you met along the way, or? Well, that's a well, that's an interesting story for me. I'll tell you how it started for me. <clears throat> I was involved in student government pretty much throughout high school. Um, I was like. Let's see, treasurer, secretary, vice president my junior year, and then student vice president my senior year. Then when I went to college, um, I majored in political science, had a minor in sociology. So, of course, from the academic standpoint, to see a possible uh, career in government in some capacity. And um, actually, though, I took a job, my first job out of college was, of course, was to get experience and make the most money I could. So my first job out of college was actually in the restaurant business. And I was actually a general manager with a major uh, restaurant franchise. And I stayed in that position for about a year and a half for the experience and especially the management experience. And it paid pretty well at that time. And after, you know, I had my stint <laughs> and then the hours were getting very long and I knew that wasn't going to be my lifelong career, I called a, um, um, a city manager in the city of Greenwood, uh, Stephen Brown, who um, gave me my first local government job. He happened to be also my little league baseball coach. He coached me. So I called him and I asked him whether or not uh, I needed to actually go back to school to get my master's degree to get entry level position in state or local government. And so it just so happened that he had a position that he was advertising for was an assistant to him. And that's how I first got in the local government. So that's that's kind of how it happened for me. So those connections that you make, don't burn those bridges. Build them up and leave them in the same state that you find them because you never know when you may have to cross it again. I'm a failed academic. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was pursuing a. <laughs> <laughs> I was pursuing a doctorate actually in international studies and was pretty much deciding this was really what I wanted to do. And I started actually doing volunteer work that led to a very, very part, part, part-time job at a local shelter. And I actually ended up staying there for 10 years uh, developing a transitional housing program. So I started with direct service in the, in the nonprofit world. And then uh, I actually came to USC to do some consulting work through uh, one of the applied institutes here. And uh, that was great because that really expanded my understanding of the nonprofit world. I was very focused on content and, and service when I was doing the homeless <coughs> work. Um, and then I got to consult across the board on nonprofit um, organizational development issues, evaluation, those kinds of things for about six years, working on contracts with funders like the uh, Duke Endowment. And then uh, from there, I, I have been at the United Way for six years now. So it's great, because and I, it was an accidental career, but it's one I feel privileged to have, and I would not have changed anything in it, uh, just the way you know it worked to have the direct experience 
which gives you a lot of credibility when you're working in areas like homelessness because people ask you all kinds of ugly questions and if you've kind of been there, done that, you can answer them. Um, and then, then to have the, the consulting uh, background that gave me the big picture really prepared me to do work for an intermediary like the United Way. So, it was okay. <laughs> and happy. Mike, you didn't quite do that piece. How about you? How'd you get there? Um, state government was a family business for me. <laughs> and it was because I grew up in a little tiny town, Chapin, and there weren't that many jobs in the 60s and 70s. And I had aunts and uncles that were a little bit older than I was, and they met at my grandmother's driveway at 7 a.m., and four or five of them hopped in the car, and they would pull over here somewhere on, on one of the streets just backside of the Capitol. And one of them went to DOT. At that time, it was the highway department to work. One of them got dropped off at the state library, <laughs> one at the CG's office, and uh, uh, a couple other places. So I used that network to find a couple summer jobs while I was in college. For two summers, I worked at the Department of Revenue, pulling staples out of five-year-old tax returns. <laughs> <laughs> And I got promoted to using a Bates numbering machine because the numbers on the check and the numbers on the forms had to match to trace the checks. Now that is dog work. But you know what? I learned the revenue sources. And I actually worked for less than minimum wage because of the, uh, the League of Cities versus us. We look it up in the Supreme Court and it said that workers in state government jobs actually could be paid less than minimum wage at the time. And we were. Um, but I used those connections, and then whenever I finished my undergraduate work at Clemson University, um, I then uh, did, I, I did a, a job for a summer where I learned as much about myself and about organizations and about having to work with people. I was a substitute teacher at Birchwood High School. Anybody know where that is? <laughs> That's at the Department of Juvenile Justice. Okay, so I was, I was behind the fence with a group of kids <laughs> that were locked up, and I had to figure out a way to control them and keep them entertained. So I used all those different connections uh, to help me land a job in state government, but the reason that I got a job was because at the time, Dennis, you'll remember this, um, uh, this was just as computerization was really taking place. And uh, one of the things that we were required to learn was SAS. So these were, these were in the days whenever we still had the old punch cards. And I learned enough of SAS in undergraduate and in graduate school. Uh, and they were running the econometric model over in state government. And they figured out it was too costly uh, to continue to use the dial-up. So they hired me to take that system with the equations, use my SAS background, and program it on the state's mainframe. And that's the reason I got hired was a cost saving measure in here and today cutting budgets. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's networking and learning a little bit and being willing to take a chance for a dog job because if you do a good job, it'll lead to more opportunity in the future. And Mark, if I can add, uh, networking, what Mike said, uh, and I'm going to give you a list of people who uh, came out of this program who've worked for me. Erica Hink is here. Uh, Jerry Thomas, Dr. Jerry Thomas. Where is Jerry now? Western Kentucky or I think Western. Right. He, he, he worked for me in the governor's office. Uh, Dr. Kendra Stewart at the College of Charleston. Uh, Jessica Gunthrey, who's in the program now. Uh, I think she's about to finish. <clears throat> Eric Dell, who, who is the, he was the chief of staff for uh, Joe Wilson, Congressman Joe Wilson. And uh, Rovelma Kelly, uh, Rovelma Diamond, when she was in the program, uh, she's my human resource director now. So uh, I have supported the program here. <laughs> <laughs> so. And I've hired two of you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you can stay for wine and cheese afterwards. <laughs> 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 uh, let me ask you all one more question, and then, and then do another uh, an hour from the segues. Um, and that is, you all have told us that hiring is becoming more difficult. 
state government shrinking, local governments under pressure, nonprofit sector is shrinking. Um, and yet my intuition is that message is not necessarily that there aren't jobs out there. And indeed, in important ways, there are jobs out there. And I would ask you all to amplify that. A couple of you talked about it, but the aging out cohort and local government, for example. Um, take that and run with it a little bit. Milton, maybe you can start from your one. Okay. Well, uh, and you're exactly correct. I mean, we have a um, hiring freeze as a, as a budget strategy at, um, at Richland County. Uh, we had a four-month uh, hiring freeze. Uh, however, in lots of the supervisory uh, positions uh, that we have in the county, of course someone who has an MPA degree um, um, always to me has a leg up uh, in local government because it tells me that you have a background and at least um, just the theoretical aspects of what we do in local government. The, the rest of it is really kind of left up to the person's initiative and how that person can sell themselves. And that's, an, a different, that's a, another subject altogether, but uh, at some point uh, you have to learn, and that's another thing about knowing yourself, you also have to learn how to sell your services. And what I mean by that is, is you know, when you get before someone, you have to have done the necessary research to know what's important to that organization or to that particular department or that person in order to make um, you that applicant that that person would want to bring on. There are going to be additional opportunities uh, out there. Yes, there are going to be fewer. Uh, there are uh, less resources and less dollars out there, but there are going to be opportunities. And not all the time will uh, the person who is the head of the class be the best and the well-rounded of the applicants uh, that are applying. I mean, usually that person who has a strong academic background but also has a presence about themselves and can really fit in your organization is going to be you know, that individual that you're looking to uh, kind of get, uh, bring on board and, and give an opportunity uh, to. Um, Erica actually uh, worked uh, with us um, as an intern on our uh, strategic um, planning process, which actually uh, is something from the development side of that that really kind of turned into a huge issue for us uh, at the county. So she was able to work uh, with us, uh, make some connections, and of course she works in our development services department in neighborhood planning now. Um, but, but making yourself available and um, getting out there, I mean, is, is, is very important. So those opportunities are going to be there. The opportunity that I mentioned about the, um, our winter meeting, um, and, you know, it may be the nonprofit world that you're more interested in, which is fine, but we want to, of course, um, get as many of you who uh, are passionate about uh, public service as possible to, to carry on our profession. And if I could just say one other thing is to, the good thing I think about what I do is, I guess, me personally, I've never been the type of person that, quote unquote, kind of needs the accolades, but I like to know that I'm doing a good job for my agency. Um, I've been fortunate enough to have um, the wherewithal to hire some very good people who work around me, my, I would consider to be my inner circle of folks. Very fortunate, as a matter of fact, I think three or four of them are MPA uh, graduates from USC. Um, so um, it really is um, uh, a very rewarding profession, I think, just from the local government standpoint, if that's something you're interested in, to be, um, be passionate about because I think this country is going through a lot of changes at this particular time. I think they're good changes. Uh, some people are all wigged out about things and think the sky's falling. I'm not one of those who believe that that is the case. I do think um, a lot of things are going to be different, but it's your generation and my children's generation are going to be the folks who are kind of making those decisions, and we, our generation, needs to make sure we leave it in good enough shape where you can um, still um, continue to prosper and make this country the, the best country on the face of the earth. So local government is a great profession to be in, very rewarding uh, if you are passionate about public service and giving back uh, to your uh, to your community. Yeah, I don't know how much I can add except to say that um, I would underscore that when, when people are coming in to do any kind of uh, applications for any kind of position uh, with, uh, that, that I have anything to do with, I really am looking to have some kind of conversation. And so that there is a presumption that you have done some 
research about us, about you know what the what you may have in a, a brief or a, a long job description or, or, or position posting. And I'm not I don't expect you to tell me how everything is going to work out great, but I really would appreciate being able to understand that you know what I'm talking about when we're when we're getting engaged in the conversation about the position. So that's always that's always been what, what really grabs me about someone is that they they can persuade me that they've got some sense about uh, the job and about the community too, because we're all, you know, obviously our work is very grounded in the community. So that's important too. And I would just say around that I, I notion of, of whether there's jobs or not out there, they, there is the, this uh, shrinking sector, and, and you're going to see that there are um, nonprofits that are just going out of business either because their programs, the critical programs, are being absorbed by other ones or uh, if um, they're, they're just disappearing. Um, the, the, the thing I've noticed, though, is that there was like about four months where it seemed like everybody was kind of frozen. And I have noticed in the last three months that things are starting to move again. So things are coming across my desk, uh, my email, saying, you know, we're, we're interested in this position. You know, we've got this posting. If you have anyone that you want to recommend, you know, let me know now. So I think there is a little bit of movement, um, but people, there, there was a lot of, uh, uh, just almost a sense of, of uh, let's not do anything right now. <laughs> let's just see how things are going to go. Uh, but I, I would say that things are, are opening up a little bit now. So there might be smaller um, numbers of it, but it is starting to shake again, starting to shake out at all different levels, top levels and uh, intermediate levels. I, I, that probably wasn't very coherent, but it was something. So. <laughs> Communication skills. <laughs> um, uh, one thing that I, I could add to that is, is you have to be able to multitask. Uh, things might be a certain way today; it changes tomorrow, or something may be added to you to your uh, to your to your responsibilities, uh, and it changes daily. Um, dealing with the budget, we're, we're constantly looking at the budget every day. Uh, then we've got the accountability report, something Erica helped us with, and we have to make sure everything matches up because you never know who's looking at each piece, and uh, these things have to match because, believe you me, that you will be asked a question if something doesn't quite match, um, especially with the, the, the way the Senate and the House looks at our budget now. Uh, right now we're dealing with uh, uh, the Obama health care issues. Uh, we're they're putting out grants uh, for agencies, to, for state agencies to handle some of the issues around uh, the health care uh, program. We're not quite sure what we're supposed to be doing, but we're learning as we go. Uh, it's it's uh, it's it's a million dollars for one grant, and I think there's two hundred thousand dollars for another grant that's coming in, and we have to be prepared because that's going to be dumped on us uh, in trying to handle those issues. So things change constantly and you just have to be prepared. There are going to be jobs for you, <coughs> so don't get worried, all right? The baby boom generation was from 46 to 64. I was born in 59. I just turned 51 years old. I'm old for a staffer, but young for a senator. And you're coming behind the tail end of the baby boom generation. Now this is my read on it and what's gonna happen. There are a lot of people out there that are like me that are that are our age. We're that big blip in the in the population explosion after World War II. We're getting tired of getting beat up. <laughs> Ben's former boss beat, beats us up all the time. He says we're inferior. I think he's full of it. <laughs> but what what's happened is you've had a workforce that's aged and is somewhere in their 40s into their 60s, and they're just getting tired of hearing all of it. And because of the state retirement system in many instances, they're eligible to retire. That's gonna create opportunity for you. And you need to be ready and available to take those slots. It's not gonna be the big wash like we had in the 60s and the 70s with the federal dollars just streaming down. Oh my gosh, how can we figure out a way to spend all this stuff? But there are gonna be opportunities for people like you who are sort of like um, the, the term they use in baseball are the utility players. You know how to do a little bit of everything and can go from one position to another to another and do it quickly and learn on the fly. That's the reason you're here. 
And the other thing that, that, that I'd tell you is, if you're in public administration, your motivation is not money. Hopefully it isn't, or else you need to go to the next building over and go look at the MBA program. And they're not doing too well these days. But you went into public service because it is public service. Okay? And I challenge you to take that and run with it because it really is, in my estimation, a true higher calling. We're serving the public. And that's different than a profit motive. And in many ways, it's a whole lot more important. And you'll have a place there. Not for profit, but very prophetic. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? All right, let me say a couple more things. Um, one is I wanted to emphasize the sort of food chain uh, that we've worked around, and that is that we are going to this year have a mentoring program, which is a relatively modest investment on your part and on the part of the folks you, uh, who serve as your mentors. Um, these folks are going to be hearing from me soon about that opportunity. Uh, for those folks who take good advantage of that and, and find opportunities, it turns into internship opportunities. Internship opportunities and mentoring turns into capstone projects and opportunities, and those opportunities in turn turn into employment and so on. So I encourage you to be thinking about that fact uh, in the story. I want to emphasize for everybody this relationship point, and I have no better uh, way of saying it than, than personal testimony. I am absolutely an anomaly. I've been here at USC for since I got my PhD. It's a long, long time. I've done lots of different things. Um, the world doesn't work that way anymore. And nonetheless, we're here because we're in a big, small, or a small, big town, and I've got relationships with every one of these folks. So Mr. Pope and the love of my life were together with the governor many, many years ago. <laughs> right? We won't say how long ago that was. Um, as Anita was developing her successes, we had some opportunities to work together many, many years ago. And Ben and I, um, in the course of several projects, ended up together. Um, everyone here goes back with me quite a ways. And it's because we find opportunities that are congenial for both of us that these things continue to work. Um, so I encourage you to pay attention to that thing. We keep saying, talking about relationships and networking. Uh, it is important, and it's not a, a sermon about exploitation. It's a sermon about uh, relationships and community. Uh, and to build on what Mike said, um, you're here to become a public servant Public service is a calling. Yeah. It's a gift in many ways. And, and we should take advantage of it. One last thing to say, because nobody else has said it. Um, I think this is a wonderful community. Um, and one reason this is a wonderful community is because it's a rich and diverse community. And I want you all to be conscious of that rich diversity that we have here in the Midlands and take advantage of it. Some of you will come from places like I did. I came from Akron, Ohio, um, where we had a diverse high school and all that, but it sort of wasn't quite as diverse as we pretended it was. And, and some of my best experiences have come since I've come here. I encourage you, too, to take advantage of that. That's the world of the future. There's lots of different people who come from lots of different places, who care about lots of different things, which is what makes public service rewarding and interesting. So please embrace that fact, and we will, every way that we can, uh, offer you opportunities to do that. And on that happy note, lurking on the other side of this wall are various libations, uh, free of charge, and we invite you to join us, the other graduate students, the other faculty, uh, for a reception, and then uh, after that we look forward to seeing you in classes, and in meetings, and in lunches, and everything else that we do. Again, welcome. And thank you for listening.